What's going on, guys? This is Rob, and we are back with Kang. Uh, only myself left to conquer, right? We are at the conclusion here, and I'm sorry it took so long. Just been doing a lot of traveling and whatnot, and it was hard to kind of make this, make a make a good video about this, right? But now I am back home, and we are back on our regular schedule. So, uh, in this video, and this, what's really cool here about this conclusion is that this is what really solidifies Kang, and and I would say removes him from being just kind of like this ambiguous conqueror that exists out there in the multiverse somewhere that like does things from time to time and actually brings him more down to earth because in reality that's kind of what Kang needed that over the years in Marvel Comics Kang has just kind of been this guy who exists in the future sometimes he shows up he fights the Avengers every once in a while you get like what is it the original Avengers forever and the timekeepers and Immortus and all that kind of stuff and the Destiny Force but you never really got to see a story that focused so heavily on why Kang is the way he is. And what this one does is it really changes that. So the idea here is that following what was basically the death of Ravana Renslayer, right? The one woman he's ever loved more than any other, that Kang's desire to conquer was less about just like creating some massive empire for himself, right? In the last video, we talked about how he did that, but it left him feeling empty. It didn't fill that hole that he thought it would fill because the reality is that hole was reserved for Ravana Renslayer. But without her in the picture, he just wasn't really able to do the kind of things he wanted to do and that's what was so cool is because he didn't feel complete when it comes to this idea of love and this is one of the things that i want to specify here right when it comes to the idea of love i think it's very easy to take a cynical approach right you know, love is the only socially acceptable version of masochism right like we go out into the world and we intentionally harm ourselves over and over and over again in the hopes that it won't actually hurt this time and we'll find the person we love more than any other it's very easy to become cynical in that way when it comes to the notion of love and for fair reason, right? I mean, there are people who've been hurt so consistently that they just by default associate love with pain because that's the only thing love has ever caused them is pain. But the reality here is that depending on who you talk to, some people will say it's worth it. And what Kang is doing here, and this is one of the things to know, the establishment of Chronopolis was not built at some place for Kang to basically rule his empire from some distant point in the future or across the entirety of the multiverse. Instead, it was to basically find his love. Love. And so when he establishes Chronopolis, one of the things to know and the easiest way to understand this is that it's like this empire, right? This citadel that he has that has strings across the multiverse. He is almost like uh, like Thor and the Bifrost, right? That like you have Asgard and you have the Bifrost Bridge that allows Thor to access any of the dimensions that are tied to the Bifrost. Chronopolis allows uh, Kang to access any of the universes that he's conquered and even some of the ones that he hasn't, right? It allows him to basically travel back and forth throughout the entirety of the time stream and the multiverse. It's just kind of his basic of operations it was also the base of operations for immortus as well but the thing about this is is why, why it was built was because of the fact that what he wanted to do was create a place whereby he could essentially scatter the entirety of ravana renslayer's atoms across the time stream now i know it sounds kind of crazy in doing that but he literally says i call this place chronopolis he says this is where we will live ravana and he says where you'll live i swear it even if it takes a thousand attempts she was not you but she had wisdom Go, my Ravana, and be infinitely reborn in the space between the stars. So the idea behind Kang here is to basically scatter her entire existence across the multiverse, and she'll be reborn in every single universe that exists across the multiverse. At that point, it's him just trying to find things. Now, what he says here is so intriguing. He says, in those moments of mastery, for I had become the master of time, I often thought that epochs and eras were measurements for lesser men that had had not invented the chronology that could contain Kang. I brought the Chronopolis, the greatest monks of the Buddha, and the most enlightened Shi'ar warrior priests, and through their teachings and on rare occasions over their corpses, I came to an understanding. A master does not allow his love to die. Those are the actions of a boy. A master compels that which he controls to become that which he loves. Using every bit of Chronopolis's power, I unravel the very fabric of time, I found the threads of fate and made the city its loom. And from it, I wove a machine of constant replication. I injected Ravana Renslayer's very soul into time, like a dye into the threads of an entire tapestry. Where time had taken her from me, I forced time to do the opposite. The birth of an infinite number of Ravanas in infinite timelines, giving myself infinite chances to save her. 
The plan was genius, it was flawless, until it began. And what we end up finding out here, and this is one of the interesting things, that Kang really, is, it's almost as though Kang has this mastery of time, but he's also a slave to it. Because every single reality that he goes to, no matter what he does, she always dies. That in one reality, she dies from the plague. In another reality, she actually rejects him, right? And it takes him by surprise. But no matter what he does, and no matter how hard he tries, he always loses Ravana Renslayer. There's nothing he can do to have her. No matter what the circumstance is, there's no way to get her. And after all these countless attempts, after all these efforts, what it's done is it's turned him cold. And that's one of the things to know here. And that's one of the things to see is that while we don't necessarily know the exact origin of the original Kang at the beginning of the story that went back and visited Nathaniel, who became this version of Kang that we're seeing now, all we know is that their origins seem very, very closely intertwined. That the causation behind what made them who they are is still the exact same thing. That when he finally finds a version of Ravana Renslayer that he's that he comes to believe may love him, the reality is she rejects him. And it's not due to anything regarding his character or at least his physical form in so far that she finds him unattractive or anything like that. She rejects him because of his character and what he'd done to her. And what she really states here is she says, the great machine knows time. It sees all those who manipulate it. Plus, I could smell you across the time stream, you hideous jackal. And she says, my life, you made me believe Leave, you were a good man, and then you stole my life. And where Kang says, no, I saved you, Ravana, you saved me, and I loved you. I love you, so I saved you. The response here is she says, my life was not yours to save. My life was my life, right? I died presumably when I was supposed to or by whatever manner or whatever means. But what you've done is you've taken my life away from me, right? You have taken away my ability to actually live a life that was meant for me. Instead, every life I've ever lived across the entirety of this multiverse has all been engineered by you. Every single life has been designed like intricately by you. Not in so far as exactly how her life unfolded, but basically she was created for a purpose. And the purpose was to satisfy the desire of Kang to have someone in his life. Imagine if that were the case, right? Imagine if tomorrow somebody showed up to you to visit you and said, hey, the whole reason you exist is because I created you. And I created you for the express purpose of being my lover. Suddenly your life has no meaning. Your life has no value because the life you lived was never truly your own. And that that's what she experiences here. That's what really torments her here. And so where Kang realizes she's kind of a failure, that ultimately Kang says, okay, fine, another failure. There's nothing I can do here. He goes to attack her and basically destroy her. And in the process of this, she destroys Chronopolis, right? She says, you're the wound in the time stream, Kang. Like you fail to realize, even after all of this, you're the problem. And that's one of the things that, that Kang says here, right? He says that all that's left to do here is to cauterize the wound. And he says, I do not remember these moments well, right? Because just his whole manipulation with time screws with his memory. And he says, I think I did not want to remember the screams. And he says, and of course, time was collapsing. The end of my rescue operation was much closer than I'd imagined. So the mind, as it often does, while exposed to the time stream, plays tricks. It erases, efficiently redacts, and kindly revises. But I can still remember her smile and the terror that it inspired. And so literally, as the final act of this Ravana Renslayer before she's destroyed, she annihilates the entirety of the Chronopolis. And so he says, the ashes of Chronopolis are there if you look for them. No matter what your temporal position, a bit of dirt on your mantle, a penny from a distant year, a book that you swore to read. That Chronopolis, just as its very function and operation, literally exploded throughout the time stream with its atoms and bits and pieces just kind of skewed everywhere. And what he says is that in its destruction, Kang, unlike you and I, who would just kind of be blown back, maybe a hundred feet or 50 feet or 500 feet or whatever it is, Kang was blown through the time stream. And so he literally fell through time. And so it's one of those things because as he was falling, he says, I arrived 10 minutes early. And then ultimately he arrived to see his younger self. And he says, I was younger than I'd remembered. Nathaniel Richards, eyes I remembered once as my own. I had felt so powerful, so capable. I'd looked at Kang with disdain. The sneer was insufferable. I swore to erase it from the boy. I gave him the chance I'd been given by the monster who made me. But with the benefit of my knowledge, I would give him the trauma. I would do it right. 
right? I would correct the mistakes of, of essentially my father, right? I would correct the mistakes of the Kang that came to me, that visited me when I was younger and brought me through the time stream. What's so beautiful about this story is it's the relation between a father and a son. Now, it's not exactly a father and a son, but by all standards of measurement, you could argue that it is, right? Kang's parents, when he was a child, were already dead. He was basically raised without any real parents at all. So when Kang from the future came back to visit his younger self, took him under his wing into the time stream, he very much became a father figure. But what he was, was a father figure that was traumatized by his own experiences, his own abuses, his own personal torment. And as a result of that, much like a lot of parents out there, he passed that on to his child. And so it's really an answer to the question, what happens when a child is raised by a parent that never learns the real lessons of their own experiences and that they try to impart on their children the better parts of themselves, but in their failure to learn their lessons, they ultimately impart on them the worst parts of themselves. That at the end of the day, the story of Kang is cyclical. It's always a circumstance where Kang always becomes Kang. But notice this, it's not Kang showing up here and saying, I will teach you to become a conqueror so that you may enslave all of existence. No, he says, I remember the wood under my fingers, the betrayer tears that leapt unbidden into my eyes. Did his mouth taste of bile? Did I lay bleeding? Did he shiver and sweat? And he says, did he feel the noose tightened around his throat? An inescapable moment, a broken heart, hate, fury so hot it will burn the stars. And so ultimately, that's what happens, right? He says, what had been was again, the lesson he needed, the one that in my fury, I felt forced to teach a lesson. And so ultimately it's exactly the same thing that no matter what happened, no matter how things unfolded, Kang can never have Ravana Renslayer. He will never have that woman in his life. He is always destined to lose that which he loved the most. And like any rational human being out there in the face of losing what they love the most, he felt anger. And instead of accepting the fact that that's just the way things unfolded for him, he basically took that anger and that rage and passed it on to his younger self. And what he thought was basically the right lesson to teach, never love. And so literally the cycle of abuse just continues. That while the lessons may have been a little bit different or how he taught his younger self may have been a little bit different, at the end of the day, the root cause was the exact same. And so that's how Kang always becomes Kang. That he says, one last chance to save Ravana. I had been given one last chance and I done only what time demanded. I was no master, I was a boy. It made me hate him all the more. That she knew me, even from the start, as I danced with Addie, she knew. She knew me for what I am. But all I wanted to be was more than Nathaniel Richards. And so in the end, what he was trying to do was basically make Nathaniel the opposite of him. He was trying to make Nathaniel a person that wouldn't become him. But the lesson that Nathaniel learned, just like the lesson this version of Nathaniel learned when he was visited by the king before him, was that that version of Kang was a bad guy, that he would seek to destroy him all the while failing to realize he would become him. And that's what he says, right? He says that like that younger version of Nathaniel left in the night, stealing the only time armor that he thought Kang owned. And Kang even says, run Nathaniel, run and become. You think me conquered, but it was not Kang who has died this day. For Nathaniel Richards is not a boy, nor a man, nor a hero, nor a villain. He is only a beginning. And he says, a Kang and a tyrant, a villain and a hero. We will be all things, experience all things, the beginning and ending of time and ours by immortality's boon. You will have the power of a God. And when you have lived an immortal's life, still, here you will stand, never love. And he says, how could I, when there is no one left to love? Across all of time, my Ravanas are gone, my past affixed, its loop completed. Her grip upon my heart releases, and so the husk stops. I have found my desiccation. And he says, let Armageddon be a funeral pyre, for there is but one escape from eternity's trap, and I stand upon its precipice. I need not even jump. I need merely to finally rest. Alexander wept because he could not conquer himself. 
but I am not Alexander. And literally, that world that he's in, right, when that meteor strikes, he's there at the very moment and simply leaves, right, just leaves on his own vessel. And he says, rest in fire, Nathaniel Richards. Rest knowing you have bested all you thought to be great in this world. Die knowing you stand astride destiny. Give your face and voice to he who created and who in turn created you. And above all things, though all on time and space may conspire to defeat you, never ever love. That's the irony of this. That's the irony and the beauty of this whole story. That when Kang, when, when this version of Kang was visited by the Kang before him, that that Kang said, never love. All it's going to do is bring you pain and suffering and sadness. And the response of Nathaniel was, that's because you didn't know love. All you knew was conquering. Love's the greatest feeling in existence. It's the greatest thing of all. And that at the end of the day, this that, that younger Nathaniel went on his quest to find a way to defeat that Kang, to destroy that Kang, to show that version of Kang that love truly is powerful. But when he encounters it, what that younger Nathaniel failed to realize is the power of love is so extreme that it can break a person on the most fundamental level. And I'm not talking about those, those guys out there who really liked the girl in their science class and they don't like them back and so love is bad. No, no, no. I'm talking about the people who gave their life to someone, right? I'm talking about those men and women out there, right? Who lived a life with somebody else, who spent years together, right? Brushing their teeth next to each other for 30 years and truly understand the meaning of sacrifice, right? And that significant other just changed their mind one day and left, or they were hit by a car and they died. Whatever the case is, that that person became that person's other half, right? Like they had spent so much time together that they were intertwined in a way that can scarcely be defined. And when that person either left or or, or was taken from them, that that person had become half their heart and half their mind and half their soul. And how do you live without that, right? And so to truly understand what it means to love and then to have that taken away and to not only have it taken away to know you can never get it back, it can break a person on the most basic and fundamental level. And that's what younger Nathaniel never accounted for. That's what he never considered is what that what what it really meant to love and then what it meant to never be able to have that love that's what broke him and so that's the the interesting lesson here is that at the end of the day Cain the conqueror despite all of his vaunted power and despite all the things he says and all the things he does and the grand campaigns and all that kind of stuff Kang is nothing more than a guy who exists out there in time and has experienced a broken heart an infinite number of times but with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. Absolutely love this story. Probably the single greatest story that's ever been told about Kang. And I will catch you all later. Peace.